Okay, let, let's start today. Have a really nice session. And I want to know if uh, the people who are in the chat that you tell me, uh, what are you expecting to learn today? Just really quickly in one, two or three words. What do you think is, is going to be about today? Whether innovation meets a CSR and where innovation meets education. I just want to check. Just going to wait a few seconds else. I'm just going to continue. Uh, don't be okay. shy to comment. Don't be shy. <laughs> yeah, don't be shy. It's okay. But all right, else in the meantime, I'm just going to put a PowerPoint up. Don't worry, it's a really fun PowerPoint. Uh, it's going to be really dynamic. So here we go. Share screen. And now you should be able to see my PowerPoint, right? Yeah, perfect. Michael, all right, perfect. So, okay, innovation meets social responsibility, right? And also innovation meets education, but we're going to start with the CSR part. My name is Nelson, and I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. So, to start, uh, we're going to check the CSR part or corporate social responsibility. And I have a meme here that I created, <laughs> and it's this one. So, if the guy is corporate social responsibility, like, um, taking corporate like from a large entity, from a large company, and the girl here is the noble cause, then more often than not, um, you know, <laughs> CSR is done because of other reasons like tax benefits or amending a mistake, uh, something that, that went wrong and they just try to correct it or improve the company's image. And today I'm here because I want to show you that is, CSR uh, is about really following the principle of helping others and how to do it. So the first question that, that I want you to just bring into your minds is, if you're a company, if you're a, let's say a Gazilla, I only have a deer here as a emoji, I'm sorry, but if you're a Gazilla really fast, like a startup or an elephant, a company that is already making money, but kind of starting to slow down or a Tyrannosaurus Rex, like a dinosaur as a company, extremely big and, and let's, you say, let's, let's call it like furious, but kind of slow at the same time. When do you start doing CSR? When are you big enough to do to do CSR, right? Uh, that's, that's a big question. And I will answer this question over the next slides, but you know, when people think about corporate social responsibility, right away, they think about uh, big companies, right? There's nothing like an SSR, like startup social responsibility on the, on the counterpart. So, it's everything about finding your cause, right? And this is where we're going to be building the entire thing. So if you think finding your cause is something that cannot only be done by an extremely large corporate, but it can also be achieved by, by a small company, by a small startup, you just need to, to find that actual cause. And let's try to understand why this isn't a working like this right now, why startups should not have corporate social responsibility, or let's call it them excuses. Well, the first one is clear. Um, there's a lack of money, so I have no, I have no idea how much money is in my bank account. At this point, I'm too afraid to check. Um, so if you have money, then you think, okay, I can make no donations, right? I cannot afford it. Then uh, if you're in a really small company or a startup, and you don't, you don't know how things are going to move for, forward, especially with Corona hitting us all, um, uncertainty, uh, and uncertainty in being part of the everyday is there and you think, okay, if I don't know how things are going to turn out, I, I don't know if I can do charity nowadays. And the other one is the, is the, like the feeling or, or the thinking that, okay, maybe we are too small uh, of a company. Uh, we're, we're too small as a company and maybe we just cannot afford it because we don't have the resources in terms of person. So, you know, if you look on the far right, CSR st stands for corporate social responsibility, where corporate means big company. Um, so why why should you be doing it if you are small or medium? But then on the other hand, uh, we have the um, we have the other side of the coin. Why startups should have corporate social responsibility, and you will find that there are a lot of benefits. And I'm not mentioning anything of of the of the ones that we saw on the meme before because that's not what we're trying to do when we're following an actual cause. And that's the first one is that you actually get a, a true vision and a purpose, you know? And that means that you're gonna get extra motivated uh, every day when you wake up, when is the last time that you woke up and you told yourself, for example, my name is Nelson, right? So it's like, I wake up and say, wow, Nelson, today is gonna be an 
an excellent day because you're going to be helping an NGO. Uh, you're going to be teaching uh, um, a lot of different kids innovation methods. So I believe that all of us need these motivations, um, not from time to time, but you know, regularly so that we can continue doing our job the best we can. Um, as an example, I don't drink coffee myself. And a lot of people ask me, how do you wake up? How do you motivate yourself to go to work? Now you know why, right? <laughs> so if you are if you are doing some things that are making this world better, um, then you definitely uh, well actually mention a point, but then you definitely have a, a big motivation every morning. Then another benefit is that um, doing CSR can become part of your culture and keep you as a company as and as colleagues really close to each other. And this can be specially achieved easily if um, you take. CSR and you implement it as a core part of your company since the very beginning because you you you're born with it and you grow with it. Um, so I just mentioned that you can possibly impact our world, which is a big benefit for everyone, and also the people uh, that you're stumbling upon, the the people that the colleagues that come on board, the investors that you meet, and so on, they will possibly get inspired by your work and will join your cause. So if you have a true cause to follow, something like a problem in the world that you say, hey, okay, I really want to change this, I really want to fix this, then you can get more people on board to help. Sometimes even people who want to support through your company. If I never had um, a lack of something, was of people that are working full-time somewhere else, but tell me, hey, Nelson, you know what? We have seen that you're doing this um this pro bono projects with whisper is it possible to join in my free time and i say definitely yes if you want to help i don't care which flag you can do it with with your own company's flag and wave it and say like yeah we are doing this but if we're gonna get more support for the for for our cause then let's do it and then i don't know if you whether you believe it or not it's gonna be a really nice source of good karma so i mean that you <laughs> if you wanted to have an egocentric argument for for why doing a csr then there there you have it you get positive karma points so finding a purpose um as well as like uh, finding your cause are the two things that you want so if you have a cost if you have a problem that you need uh, that you think it needs to be solved and you make it your purpose to follow it then you're going to have a more just like uh, um painful life um, you will feel better every day uh, you probably already know the concept of Ikigai, which is Japanese for a reason for being. But what what it tries to do is uh, when you're trying to find your dream job, it checks what you love doing. Then it checks what you're good at, where you have expertise, something that you can do well. It checks something that the world needs, but also at the same time, something that, that people will be willing to pay for so that you can make money because it's a work and you have to, I don't know, like pay your rent. So and you see that if you mix what you love with what you're good at, then you have found your passion. If you feel, if you mix what you love with what with what people need, then you have a mission. If you find something that people need and something that you will get paid for, there's a vocation. And if you're there's something that you're really good at and you will get paid for, it's your profession. And if you mix all of them together in the middle, then you have ikigai. So I've been doing a lot of research around to find out uh, specifically. Um, how uh, to apply ikigai uh, for business pur uh, purposes and i talked with the with the japanese experts that i know and we put a lot of effort into it and now we have found that the japanese word for ikigai for business is called bisnikigai no i'm kidding so it's not bisnikigai but it's just for for <laughs> trying to bring that <laughs> the point across so if if ikigai was a reason for being then bisnikigai will be a reason for existing and I mean, as a business. And you see, uh, on the left side is like, you bring uh, the expertise that you can, that, that your teams have, uh, or, or, or so like basically saying the sort of services that you could provide or the people that you could hire, something what makes money, because I'm not trying to go full NGO here or on the middle of the way social business. I'm talking about businesses that are supposed um, to, to be making a profit every day, like the businesses as we know it, so, but but still, you know, you can you can have, have something good to do. So again, uh, your uh, expertise from a team, uh, finding out what makes money, mixing it with a problem that needs to be solved. And if you see mixing it with a novel cause, if you mix the four of them, then you can get this Nikki guy, just to say, with your business. And 
one best practice, I'm, I'm sorry, I have been hitting you with lots of Venn diagrams. This is going to be the last one, you know, like mixing the circles together. My best practice is when you're defining your vision, so you will take your company's vision and your actual, and you will mix it with this novel cause. And where they touch is, is each other, this is the, the sweet spot, okay? That's, that's, your, um, that's the treasure that you're looking for because this is your way of including a corporate social responsibility since, since your company is really, really small. Let's write instead of CSR for corporate, like company social responsibility in this case. So I want to show you an example from my own company. And you will see that the Whispers vision is aligned with, with a pure education goal. So it, this is from the website, but you will see like Whispers vision is to spread human-centric perspective on innovation, okay? Basically educating people uh, teaching a human per centric perspective on innovation. And then the mission goes, continues, and tries to, to build a little bit more on it. Our mission is to make innovation easy. We want to drive curiosity and be the source that ignites the first part for your next great idea, the great idea just ready to be born. So, okay, the last part is a little bit marketing. This part, but you see, it's about teaching others. So, again, the goal is a pure education goal. Um, and we have, in this really easy, a vision, we have mixed something that is good for our world, something that, that, that follows a, a good cause with our expertise and with something that, that we can also get paid for. So when you have something like this, and now I'm going to show you how I created this business to work as an ecosystem, uh, which, is the, which is the cool part, because I told you this is not a social business that only that all the money that the cons uses to grow so that it can help it just purely help others. It's also definitely not an NGO um, because we are indeed for profit. But it's a normal business. It's just one business that decided that one third of its core is going to be something good for the world. And what we have here is the first the big part is like um, innovation and problem solving. That means our customers, they have big complex problems and they pay us so that we come and solve them. So that's why the fire for the customers and we come and solve them. But we also develop uh, innovation methods that we are uh, the whole time teaching to other people and getting feedback and just like applying them to real cases, seeing how they work until they are, you know, like uh, fit enough to be spread at big time. And then we have an education and pro bono part. That's our social engagement part. That's our own CSR since the very beginning. And to see how the cost works, like in a chronological matter, a manner, and in a way that you also understand how it works as an ecosystem. Our customers have a big complex a problems to solve. So they give us they give us money so that we solve them, right? Um, with this money, what we do is we put this money into designing uh, innovation methods that will um, indeed solve these kind of problems and other problems as well. We try to make them specific enough so that you can apply them for certain types of, um, of problems, but generic enough so that you can apply it, let's say, like to the same type of problems in different industries. Um, and then we go ahead and we, we design these innovation methods and we start teaching them. Uh, we use this also in our pro bono uh, part. We teach them, uh, for example, just uh, last year, we taught over 700 um, teenagers innovation methods so that they can get empowered and can start solving problems on their own. And then when we are doing this, we're starting to get feedback around the innovation methods. We are applying them to actual real problems around communities and so on. So we can kind of like approve, um, approve a method to say, okay, this method is fit so that we can reuse it. And then all these methods that we are uh, teaching and that we are getting feedback from, we apply them back so that we can solve a problem. So that, again, customers come to want to solve their problems with the money to develop new innovation methods. We use, we, we uh, teach these methods. We actually get kind of approval. We utilize them. And you see how a business has been created in a way that uh, social responsibility here on the right is always part of the core. It's part of, of how the system works here. So yeah, is ESR just about making donations? Uh, yeah, I believe until now you have seen that you don't have to be the elephant or the dinosaur to make CSR. You can be a startup, right? It wasn't clear before, just saying. But is it just about making donations? So as you saw before from the example before, no. Um, just so that you have an idea, yeah, you can even think about, okay, CSR is making money and donations. Um, but this, I guess, if you're just doing something like this, uh, maybe it's for making your image better or for 
tax benefits. I mean, before people don't do it, please at least do it. But it is better if you actually get engaged, if you get involved in what your activity is. And this is the second part of ESR is when, you, when you're there and say like, hey, I'm helping, I'm gonna support, uh, I'm gonna be part of it. Um, so I'm going to show you because we are not making any donations. This is a startup that I started two years ago, so we cannot afford that, but we help in many, many other ways. So I have here some examples. We are organizing, um, or we were before Corona because these are pre-Corona pictures, as you might imagine, organizing uh, on-site events all the time. We are just for free uh, teaching and coaching people, showing them new innovation methods, asking them that the only thing that we ask for them is that they that they continue uh, showing these methods and applying these methods in different places and just teaching it to other people so that more and more people are empowered uh, with these methods so that more and more people are uh, able to I say like fix whichever problem or whichever challenge they come across. Um, then um, on the other hand, you have here an example of how we are applying, you know, on hands methods, you know, like prototyping and so on. And all of these events, we were always doing it for free. Um, and what we were doing is, you know, to at least convince some people at first, it's kind of like at least sponsoring the food and, and, the, and the drinks. And we will get, I don't know, like, to do an event like this is 500 euros. So if you go and donate 500 euros, you can do some change. But if you apply these 500 euros and bring a lot of people and empower them and ask them to continue supporting and helping and spreading your, your vision, then you're doing way more with this little money. So um, another way that is super easy to do and something that you can start right now is sharing your knowledge. So a lot of people ask me, hey Nelson, so, um, why are you sharing your innovation methods uh, openly on, on the different media? Um, the answer is easy. Yep, we don't we don't want to hold this this uh, we don't want like to kind of like kidnap these methods and just just hold them back from everywhere. We want to share them with everyone because at the end our vision and our vision is to spread a human centric perspective of innovation, right? So by defining the vision, it's only logical that we come and that we just spread spread uh, these methods that we are le already learned and tested and, and are applying every day and that we, we uh, lear like help others learn these methods all the time. So in Instagram, we're always sharing lots of tips, learn, like here, how to learn faster at the beginning of Corona, how to use a, like different digital tools to collaborate remotely, presenting ideas that we have been learning from the people around. So basically, sometimes we stumble uh, across a really nice idea that a single person had. Um, by the way, uh, Hulder here, he was also a uh, part of Youth Time. So he had a really nice uh, story that was really inspiring. I said, hey, Hulder, uh, can we please share it with other people? Um, he says like, yeah. So we're always trying to, to kind of bring more people on board um, with our vision. And if you think about how to do it, we have a set of rules uh, for anything that we are posting in social media. And it's that whichever post we do, it has to have a triangle that, okay, it's always, um, it's always inspiring in some way, inspiring by giving some examples, by showing what is possible. Then that is informative. Uh, informative means that the people who see them can learn something. Uh, and the third part is that they are entertaining. So you have a little bit of fun and, and looking them around. So, by the way, informing wasn't like making, ah, here, 10% discount or buy this product. This is not informing for us. Informing is giving information that is actually bringing a higher value to you. So, if you're scrolling and you stop at, at one of our posts and you take your time to read them, we want to produce, generate value for you because this is us giving away. But you see, it's a really small way to start including a CSR. There's one a big company called HubSpot, and they basically sell um let's call it like sales funneling services online but all their knowledge they give away for free they have webinars they have everything they never tell you hey come on here and book our product then you get the, the information they give it for free because it's in a, in part of their vision and this is something that i like and then like on linkedin we will be bringing a, again like doing lots of of presentations uh, different um interviews with people who have great ideas to share so it's kind of like this vision, okay, we want to continue sharing stuff and organizing webinars, this started happening. So you see everywhere where we are, we try to just give away our knowledge. This is our way of giving all the time because if you don't have money, what do we have to give? So on LinkedIn, you will find our 
20 plus articles around topics innovation education, just giving the knowledge away for free, giving to the community, giving to our followers. And then definitely you possibly thought before, if you don't have any money to give uh, and okay, and just giving knowledge is not enough, then you can go into the direct offering of your service for free or for an extremely heavily reduced price, just so that you kind of at least cover part of the cost. Um, in this case, for example, uh, with a big NGO in the country where I come from in El Salvador, uh, we are uh, running workshops for them and doing trainings and so on. And this is the, the NGO with, along with, we uh, got over 700 teenagers innovation methods. And this is, is, is really weird to explain, but you just kind of wake up and you're really looking forward to these days. Uh, you're really looking forward to to seeing the faces of all these kids and how excited they get and hearing and answering their questions. This is something that is some like a like deep inside and it it's like like some sort of unlimited fuel continues feeding you again and again and it just grows more and more with the time. So this is this is the way how we do it. Um, and maybe the example is one day i hope uh, there is a, a big company called uh, whisper as well like 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 my company but the difference is this other whisper is in the uk and they do cancer support right and we are kind of eating away a lot of their exposure in certain online medias because when people when people find a uh, whisper they find us instead of them because we're i don't know like digital natives and we do our seo uh, but one day we want to like we were thinking and, and, and talking in the group okay one day we're gonna make a, a, a big donation to them when the day comes like we want to say hey look you're whisper we are whisper we will help each other here's a donation but to get there we started here so let's say like csr level one and then eventually when you can you you implement it and go to csr level two and one day you can go big time like the big companies and also do that like these big donations and biggest events or whatever you you can imagine, and th this will be the CSR level three. But the important thing is that you know that you can, there's always, it doesn't matter how small uh, or big a company is, there's always a certain amount of time that you can take for doing good for the world. And the more you um, start growing with your company, the more involved you should get uh, in these sort of topics. So basically, at uh, the end, what I'm saying is, if you have a CSR level one at the very beginning, if you include that one third, every third project is going to be um, is going to be a pro bono project. But at the time that your company is large and it has a hundred employees, maybe if every six or seven project is a pro bono project, that will be a huge deal, right? Um, or maybe maybe you continue exactly the same culture with say every third project is pro bono. And everybody's happy. Believe me, people people that, that work with you, they are just happy to, to get on board this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, so before we go into innovation meets education, I just want to uh, check if there's any if there's any question from the chat. Hello, hello, Amos. Any any questions about CSR? So we can have a little five minute discussion about what you think. Don't like there's there are no wrong questions. You can just you can just tell anything that occurs to you, any comments, any questions. Because later we will go into innovation meets education. What do you think about it? Do you think it's bluff? Do you think this is indeed uh, <laughs> thank you? <laughs> like the lights went off, but but my colleague came here to to turn them on again. I um, think people have been a bit apprehensive. <laughs> it's always a bit nerve-wracking to be the first one to be writing questions. Um, but we've, I mean, we've got a comment from uh, Amos here, um, which is yeah, about, right. excited about um, potentially doing uh, work with you in the future. So I suppose there's a question there in it, which is how can anyone link up with WeSpark to kind of get influence from you to kind of get that support yeah, well, for CSR? Like you can definitely, you can definitely uh, like follow our media and if you want to go your CSR step two and you tell something like uh, Nelson wants to talk to you, just write and tell me, Nelson, I know how to do this. I would like to get more exposure, but just for the CSR purpose, no, like, because what is what is the benefit in getting exposure with lots of teenagers, right? It's not like you're going to be making business with them, getting their cafeteria money. So something that tells me like, yeah, I would like to, to, to get used to 
it, like you can use it for yourself. Like I want, I would like to learn how to teach better, and I want to start with with, with kids, but I want to give my knowledge away. Then we have something that we can start, you know. So just get to me and ask me. Else, uh, just by by following and, and interacting with our stuff, uh, with our content, that's that's a big a big chance. You can specifically just interact with the social responsibility content that we publish, and that will be super. That will that will be totally fine. Uh, thank you, Amos. I, I hope that I that I kind of um, that I kind of uh, got to the point there. Now I'm gonna read Joshua Joshua Stonosos. What is the biggest challenge you have faced in starting WeSpark? Um, Joshua, just a big question from the CSR part or in general as a company. And then we will go to Dana's Dana's question. This one new reply. I don't know how to see it. I will click on top. Ah, from the CSR part. Yes, okay, Yosha. So, uh, and then I will go to Dana's. The most difficult, the most challenging part was um, to convince, like, you, you would not believe it, but it's like getting your first customer. You're giving something away for free, but people are not used that little startups want to help them. So, sometimes, and special, specifically at the very beginning, the very first pro bono customer that you have that is not paying anything will be a skeptic and you know i it, it took it took a little bit of time to get to the point where we are with our social projects the first ones were some universities you know kind of like like low stakes and and maybe the first real real problem that is kind of an existential problem is when things turn difficult uh with your own business what happens with CSR? Do you stop doing it or or not? So that was like the that was one question that I had at, at, at one point. And specifically, maybe what I would like to tell is that when Corona arrived, our business went from hundred to zero. Like the company was around one year old and we just managed to get to this phase that okay, we're no longer losing money, we're winning a little bit but we are stable right and corona came and within two weeks absolutely all our customers um cancel or just move to the uncertain future uh, whatever whatever job we were supposed to do with them so our 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 business just stopped completely and usually people would think like okay if you don't have any more uh, like any more incomes then you cannot do charity at all you cannot help and um, I have a like I'm sitting here at WeWork and I, I usually sit with a lot of my entrepreneur friends and we had a meeting on a Saturday, the, the Saturday right before the lockdown will, will start in Germany. And one of my colleagues said something really something that really that really touched me. He said, I believe none of us should wear a cape now. We're all startups, we're gonna wear a cape and say like we are here to help. But we should just go to our customers and try to help as much as we can. So Whisper went from one third of all activities being for, for social responsibility to going full CSR. So in this moment is where we were um, asking people if they need support totally for free. Uh, for the people that, that, that kind of knew, okay, eventually they're going to have budget or something. We made some sort of compromise. We will help them one hour, two hours for free. But then for NGOs and social businesses, we started offering our projects, our, I'm sorry, our services 100% for free. Honest, there was like some costs that we could not cover by any chance. Um, so in the moment of, in the moment of the pandemic, uh, even I attended one hackathon. Uh, it was the largest hackathon ever in history. It was organized by the German government. And we had uh, within a few hours the most like a popular project, and because of this, uh, some some media started covering uh, our project and covering me as a person doing interviews. It was a project called Karma Courier, and then it was in German TV and uh, uh, Salvadorian press started writing about me, and then Forbes Latin America wrote me and says like, okay, we would like to cover your story, and again and again, this has moved a lot of. <laughs> A lot of other companies and, and media, a media production companies, uh, and newspapers and everything, writing articles about Whisper and Karma Korea about my person, and they move a lot more of the business. So I don't know what you want to call it, 
I believe I call it good karma because when we started doing these projects for the hackathon about uh, the hackathon, sorry, I forgot, was specifically about tackling Corona issues and Karma Career uh, will be a social business in, in that case because we're still in the process of founding and we found so many challenges along the way and we are still around like eight, 10 people uh, along with the project. But it, it just good things started to happen after and the, and the business after a few months because it took some 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 time it just bloomed so if somebody was now skeptic saying like yeah it will never pay off in case that this is how you want to view things then yes it will and not as a business just how you feel every day it's it's enough yeah it's, it's the biggest payoff you will be happier as a person what else do you want in your life and you when you're happier you're healthier when you're you know, everything just, just goes better. So I hope that answers your question, Joshua. So when the things go bad for your actual business, how to get, you know, how to continue with it is the difficult question. Before I get to that question from Frank, I'm gonna answer the one from Dana. Um, hi Nelson, it's a great presentation. Thank you very much, Dana. I'm looking forward to the education innovation part. Okay, perfect. We're getting into that one right away. So I'm gonna answer the question from Frank. No questions, but representation and graphic design. Thank you, Frank. We all we do it all in-house. <laughs> so we got one okay, more question so here, I've, Nelson. Uh, we've got one more yeah. question here, which is um, to do with your philosophies you've kind of showed so far. A lot of it seems to be based around um, how you start a business with the core of CSR, which is great, and that's what we really want to encourage. Um, but how would you feel? Well, what's your opinion on how to implement that into established businesses? So businesses have been around for for years and years and years already stuck in their ways how how would you then try and approach them to start changing to that philosophy okay i will tell it from two different perspectives um, bottom up or say like you're an employee you don't have to be team manager or whatever and then uh, I, i'm gonna get for that second and then the first one that i want to explain is if you are already in a, in a leader in a leadership position so if you're in a leadership position you have to make the decision first for yourself and, and and really commit to it and with that i'm not going to i don't want to say any names but i have been working for for different airlines before i have been talking with lots of people who are into airlines and once i had a conversation with somebody um, who's around this industry and this person knew that by only increasing the cost uh, by 13% or 13% of the cost that we, they already had, they could neutralize the CO2, the, the carbon emission, right? So this person says like, I have an idea. So we're going to charge our customers by giving them, okay, even you buy your ticket or you pay more and you buy your green ticket. And then you know that when you're flying, you're not, uh, you're not gonna be contaminating the world anymore. It's just gonna be neutral. And I told them, look, cool. I'm, I'm glad that you're thinking and that you're aware about this. But what you're telling me and what you're telling um, everyone else who's really aware of this problem is, you're telling me, as, I as a company, like we as a company, we are aware of the issue. We know that it's possible to neutralize it and not cause any more of the issue, but you're giving all the responsibility away. So you're not committing. Because if I notice that somebody's moving all the responsibility to their customers, then I will be the first one who lights a torch and goes into strike and all kind of say like, what are you doing, right? You are aware about it and you choose not to do anything. Uh, um, so if you want to have commitment, then you have to say, I don't know, for example, okay, we will offer a green ticket. So 50% pays the customer and the other 50% we assume, like kind of like these companies say like, if you donate $1, we're gonna double it. If you donate one euro, we're gonna double it. So uh, ways of getting commitment is, I don't know, hire someone and allocate the budget for this person to help you develop in your company um, CSR activities. And the second part, if you're an employee in a company and you want to start something, I don't know, use your coffee time when you're around, I don't know, getting some water, uh, drink, having a coffee with your colleagues and tell them, uh, tell them about what you would like to do around CSR. Tell them that that's something that, that, that moves you and see how they react and try to find I don't know two, three, four people that will be willing to do something. I don't know, maybe dedicate 5% of their time or one, one day a month or one day every two months for a CSR activity, and then just go ahead and convince your boss. And I believe that's a, a really nice way to start.
I hope that answers uh, your question. Uh, okay, I can see to your replies. Great answer. Thank you. Okay, this was the one from Josh. I'm sorry, I'm I'm not so fast in checking here. Uh, okay, perfect. Thank you. And then I'm checking. Frank says, okay, this Marcus answer, I guess, right? Perfect. Uh, we have another question, and before we move to education part, what is your what is your an average day look like in the office? Oh, Nevena, there's nothing like an average day. Every single day is different. The office that you see behind us, we have it since two days, and there, there's this. This is like like Disneyland. So you see like the green screen and prototyping things uh, right here, and green screen, and there we have an area for virtual reality and then we have an area for doing a uh, prototyping and so on. And there we have a uh, Jorge building the uh, podcast launch and so on. So we have so many colorful projects that there's nothing like an average day. There, every day is different. And we're always trying to mix this, you know, like doing something cool. We do something, something good for the world uh, with it. You know, by nature, we created a business. It's called We Spark, like in like in a fire, like a, something that starts something. So we're only at the start of the products. That means that all our customers, um, at least the, the paying ones, they come with projects that are at the very beginning. So we create something new and then they continue on their own. So there's nothing like a, ah, we go and get into meetings and consulting every day. Today we had some workshops, now webinars yesterday as well, but the day before was a lot of building around um tomorrow and friday we will be designing some stuff inside of virtual reality so it's it's because of the nature of the of the business it, it looks different every day but yeah i hope that that answered your question as well but i say we move on with the second topic yes michael yep uh, okay perfect okay and i hope that that answers your question but you can also check online in our social media what and see what what we do. We're going to um, I just hire somebody who's going to be a content and entertainment manager, just for the specific purpose of showing how much fun we have here and how to apply it in other companies. I don't know. I don't know why. Why I don't know if that even is going to make money. I don't believe so. But it's about having fun, right? So you got to check those those things. But yeah. So I'm going to continue with the presentation at this point. Uh, okay. Let me just have a little sip of water. I've been talking all day. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, when it comes to innovation, this is a topic that really moved me since a long time. Let's say, like, basically, since I'm aware of things, I always thought about education. I was not really happy about it. So I said, okay, innovation, uh, education needs innovation, indeed. Um, and this is the part that mixes with with our CSR. So you see, our vision has a pure education purpose. But Michael, did I hear anything or am I hearing stuff? Everything is good, right? Everything sounds perfect. Yep. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I want to tell you a little story. So this is this this is me. I really, I really hate watching myself in books, in big screen. But so this is how people picture me. They picture me as the, the, the customers and people around the community. They picture me as the innovation guy, the guy that's coming and change everything. Same with, with my other colleagues around here. But the truth is that I never felt like the innovative or creative guy my entire life. Um, in fact, this is this is a really abstract view of how I felt. I'm the yellow point there. And I felt that I didn't belong to a group. And I'm specifically talking about, about school. For some reason, my ideas were not really what people expected. Uh, some, some teachers, uh, such professors, yes, others not. But more often than not, uh, my colleagues and, and, and teachers will, sometimes I will feel just like totally ignore whatever ideas I had from the school. I feel that my ideas will get systematically, um, let's go filter. <laughs> and, it's, and it's, really, it's really heavy, right? Because when you're a kid and you're having ideas and nobody seems to affect them, you think to yourself, okay, my brain is trouble something is not working well or there's something wrong with me that that must be it what what other explanation do you have to uh, oh by the way since <laughs> already the people are leaving the office we're getting without light but yeah sorry um but again you you're 
you are just there and you're thinking to yourself, maybe it's my fault that people don't like my ideas because my ideas must must be bad. And you know, the big question that I had is when I was growing up, uh, like, um, is um, so if before it would look like this, why nowadays people take the time to to listen to the to the stories and to the ideas that I am the colleagues here with that we have to share? What change? Right, so we went from being misfits to to often having the possibility to to be in the center. That's why we when we have it, we want to use it for something valuable, and, and something valuable is producing value for anybody who's watching or hearing. Um, so, and to explain this, how this changed, I started thinking about schools and how much they have changed. So I have this graph here, and this graph is the perceived degree of innovation on the on the top and the time. So a perceived degree of innovation means how we feel that things are, are, are moving forward. So if you think about most industries, uh, industries and technologies, you think like, wow, in the last years, because of digital slash everything, everything's been growing exponentially. Innovation, the degree of, uh, uh, of change is just so fast. Innovations are happening every day, it's exponential. And then if you think about schools, you will not think of schools the same way. You will think of something more like the pink line here. So whoop, it's going and then poop. It just it just innovated a lot at once, and that was because of COVID nineteen, right? <laughs> so so what what is happening there? And what is happening is I believe that we have a, a, a big challenge forward. Um, and I I have this big challenge. I believe that we have three things that we can change in this. So I just want today to more than than explain what's wrong is suggest what we could change in, in every school in the world and um, stick with me because the next following suggestions they might be super controversial and i wrote an article about it to see what people think and um, yeah i would very much like to know at the end in the comments and in, in, in the questions but yeah the first suggestion will be to include a session about talking a session about talking and discussing topics that are going around the world right now, especially if they are difficult topics. So first, the problem that I'm going to elaborate before you jump and say like, no way. I believe that if you go around and, and check the, the, the news, let's say let, just check American, like see USA, a country that is heavily polarized, it's split in half. And all of this has been happening because people never really learn how to talk with each other and how to elaborate on an idea together and come to consensus. They never learn how to properly discuss things. And possibly they never really learn um, how to agree to disagree, which, which is okay as well. So how to not get involved in a personal way and just like staying professional. All of these, all of these skills are acquired only by doing. And if you, yeah, first you have discussions in every school when you have some sort of project together. But the thing is, maybe you're discussing about whether to use a, a I don't know, white or beige looking paper for your cardboard project. So that's not a big deal. It shows you how to discuss. But what happens when you need to discuss something around religion or something around politics? who prepares you for that, right? And some schools have something called, um, I believe like a de debate, is that in English correct, Michael? Like a debate club, like for debating, debating? Yeah, um, it's, more, it's more of an American traditional than it is English, but yeah. That yeah, so in the, <laughs> thank you, Michael. So in the in, in the Western culture, you have something like this very often. But the problem that, it, that you have it is that when you say that you have some sort of deba de debate a course or session, is that you imply that one person is going to win one side is going to win always so it's not a discussion it's just argumenting and kind of a show to see who can argument better who 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 is right it's not about coming into consensus right so i believe that if every school will have since the very beginning i don't let's say like first grade starting to to talk about ongoing topics first um topics that are not so controversial uh let's say not about religion but but starting to talk about the children about uh what's happening with the trash around in the streets or something like this 
and then bring in bring in um, different ideas together and then the sole purpose of the teacher will be to be moderating and to help them always find consensus that will make the, the world like in the next generation a way better place just if people learn to talk with each other and again i said it like three times again but it's all about learning how to come with consensus with with other people then the second one is if you basically teach um kids innovation methods and with innovation methods everything applied on getting some problems and applying these innovation methods to create valuable ideas, ideas that can be real and ideas that will, you know, do a, a, make a better world. And this one is possibly less controversial and quite simple, uh, but you will need to find professors that are, you know, willing willing to, to go out and look for problems that kind of fit the different levels of the kids. And for example, a first grader will be working on something around, um, let's say, uh, making the school a better place or I don't know like uh, I don't know let's say like making a, a nicer playground for the school uh, while the other people uh, uh, that are in ninth grade uh, like let's call it the later students or uh, or scholars they will be working on something around climate change for example and then you're always talking on more complex problems and then just teaching the kids innovation methods how to move forward how to move forward with problems or problem to, to needs from needs to futures from futures to ideas and the future that I see is that you will have um, like the, the, the new, the new young, uh, like the new generation, they will be on every corner and power around to solve whichever problems they have. And if you think about it, if you have people in power in different communities, then they can solve whichever problems they have. I saw a few years ago a documentary about a kid, a, a teenager that built his own nuclear reactor at home. So I tell you, look, if, a teenager can learn this because he was empowered by internet and he had the, the willingness to go out and check how to do these things on YouTube and Googling. Then imagine if, if in the school we will learn um, we will learn the kids how to have always a positive perspective and empower them with the tools to move forward all the steps so that they are not scared, so that they know how to do things on themselves. Then you could, I don't know, like uh, find ways to clean water and to produce electricity and especially to handle with feces around the world in the most remote places. You just need people that know how to gather ideas from groups, how to moderate the process and basically how to facilitate innovation. So this is my second suggestion. Imagine one hour of uh, one hour of talking around, having these discussion rounds uh, per week, and then maybe two hours of problem solving and innovation methods a week, what it could change. Then this takes me, this takes me to the third part. And this is my favorite one. What is school for? What is school about? Why, why do you go to school? You go to school to learn, right? But if you think about schools, schools have not been created to teach us how to learn. School is more about testing. If you remember school, you will be doing a lot of, you know, like low clerical work, just hearing, copying, writing down. Yeah, right, memorizing things, uh, taking notes. So I want, to make school, let's say, more motivating, more engaging for everybody. So I want everybody to have a favorite, a favorite lecture. So the idea is that every single semester, so as to say, or every single trimester, whatever, like wh whatever amount of weeks or months a, a school device, their whole package uh, of studies, their whole uh, curriculum in, I want every, scholar or student to have a favorite lecture every time and the only way to do this is by having a like session just for learning how to learn okay and that means you get to choose the topic a hundred percent freely and your teacher your professor everything what what uh, she or he is going to do is help you understand the topic from different perspectives and helping you to apply the topic for something that is good for the world so basically, if I like video games, I would take uh, the topic video games this semester and my professor uh, or teacher, I'm sorry, in, in Spanish you say professor to teacher, but yeah, your teacher is going to help you to kind of find a structure on how to, to present this topic, how to apply it to something important, um, maybe looking at, at the, from different perspective, what is bad around it, what is good around it, 
learning how to um, how to analyze sources, which is possibly one of the best skills that I learned at school. And I didn't know it until so, like five years ago. I was so aware that uh, our professor, our teacher, always insisted us in in looking at our sources and understanding what is their bias, what is their perspective, what might have affected them, and always ask us to have an argument against our own arguments. At least say, okay, I'm aware of this, and then put things in a balance. So this is really learning how to learn. Take whichever topic in the world moves you and learn around it, and then just develop this methodology of how to learn faster every time, how to get into a new topic, because if we learn how to learn, then we can do absolutely everything. And this is the one topic that is missing. So imagine at the end, you even have the possibility to give the freedom of, of presentation. If depending on the nature of your topic, uh, you might present it as, as a presentation or with a poem or with a song, with a video, with a theater, with a, with a sketch, with some art or a sculpture. So you should be able to present it the way that it makes sense, because later when we get to work we have to come out with ideas we have to learn fast and we have to present stuff all the time so i believe that learning to learn is the one thing that could move things forward and i believe one hour a week just a session of one hour where you can like go to your professor and kind of get feedback on how to continue how to structure your work which perspectives you're missing it will be a totally game changer so again these little changes in education that i'm proposing they are so big, but at the same time, so small that I believe that you can start because yeah, if you will give me the chance, I will reinvent the curricula, but it will take generations for these changes to happen. But if you only add exactly what we need in this moment, uh, what is going to prepare us, then maybe we can have changes within a year. So it's kind of the compromise, the highest impact with the lowest effort to achieve. And this, uh, to all of you, this is my idea of how innovation meets education. So thank you very much. <laughs> my name is Nelson and well, you can find me basically everywhere, but if you want to write me an email, you can write me here or just Google uh, Nelson Javier Mejia, connect with me on LinkedIn, just don't give follow, press on the little three dots and, and press on connect. Let me know, just write me a message. Hey, I saw your presentation and now we have a, a good topic to start. So you're seeing here on the on the on the on the left below my my profile it says uh, before my picture uh, below my picture it says that our work starts when we captivate your mind and it ends when you captivate others. So this is this is what we do. We want to inspire. We want to bring innovation forward. And I hope that you like this presentation. So yeah, just go out and you can release your inner genius now. I hope. Thank you so much for that kind of insight and I suppose motivation into getting people to get a new perspective and that, that's what it's all about really getting a new perspective and training our minds to get a different perspective. Um, I couldn't yeah. agree with you more, especially with the current circumstance. There's a lot of things going around in the media where everything's very binary and if we all kind of look to try and take on the opposite yeah. perspective more so, it'll be great. Um, but from my side, I suppose I've got a question, which is how would you look to instigate bringing that into education yeah so i have this is this is the biggest secret ever <laughs> i'm gonna do a ted talk about this topic uh, in badus um, so if you google my name and write tedx then you will see that i'm doing a ted talk about this topic so this is going to be my moment to go on and i will have a call to action at the end and i'm going to tell to everybody who's in education if you're in the position that you can bring me to somebody who can decide. Let's get into it, and we will find we will find a framework. We will design a framework to apply this this to any school. Um, but you can imagine that it's a lot of work, and you need to apply uh, apply this to 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 every single school separately and find out what are their you know like their specific challenges. Because I think such as having uh, discussions, open discussions in a school depending on the culture, it can get super, super difficult, right? I mean, uh, there are schools where topics around politics and, and religion will be a total no-go. There are schools where maybe the bias from the teachers might be a challenge. So I'm just going to go out public with this. I already published it in an art, on an article, uh, and actually possibly with my 
with my uh, country, we might start something like this. Like they got really moved by it, but you know they are government institutions, so they need more, a little bit more time. Um, but yeah, that's that's the way to start it, and that's the way to to kind of also explore at the same time what the challenges are. Doing this presentation here is a little, little, little step forward. But yeah, I so hope that that answers your uh, question. CSR itself, then. <laughs> So it's a project yeah. of these companies and experts trying to come into the education system yeah. and yeah. Uh, sharing their knowledge on those topics where you can see both sides. Um, so it is a CSR project in that. So it's something a lot of businesses can actually Indeed. take on and kind of integrate. Yep. So let's. I will go with the questions. And by the way, in the chat or the Q and A, you can write. Um, I don't care where exactly it is. You can write which is the one that you like the most, and maybe if you have one one of the three suggestions that you said, yeah, this one doesn't work, this is the most challenging. Just let me know as well, because I'm about to go totally open with this, and this in actually in exactly one month. So <laughs> the more feedback I get, the better. But okay, I'm gonna start with um, the first question is from Nevena. What okay, no, I must know from Warren. How will you advise encouraging a mindset of innovation? in places that do not have access to technology. Okay, Warren. Um, first of all, you don't need, you don't need technology specifically to bring this mindset forward. Because the mindset of innovation, like adopting an innovator's mindset, is all about being open and being going out and learning and trying to find the resources yourself. I have a separate presentation uh, around it. Let me just check two of the other questions. Uh, and if they, if, if they are not complex, then I can show you another slide of exactly how we do that. I don't know, that might be interesting. Else, if, if we cannot answer, just write me and I can, I can just share this with you because this is actually really interesting. This is what we do. So I will just check the other ones. Yes, even just a discussion is helpful. Okay, hi, uh, okay. I'm, I'm reading Dana's text now in the chat. Yes, even just a discussion is helpful. I use this in some of my classes with sixth graders and high school students. And they came up with awesome solutions on different topics. Okay, that, uh, nice to know that, that you're teaching. So I would very much love to hear your feedback about the last part. Then Amos says, I have a boy into this idea and I think this is a new direction schooling should begin to go in. Thank you, Amos. Whichever way you think that we might bring it forward, uh, that would be awesome. So I'm going then, if that's okay, to show Warren specifically. So how would you advise encouraging the mindset of innovation in places that do not have access to technology? Okay, uh, I will show you one thing, um, just one picture. So you don't actually need technology. So this is our like golden triangle. We say that, so all around the mindset, the mindset in, in, in itself is just, you and your willingness to want to do things in a different way, better test to learn and so on. So mindset is completely, completely away from, from any topic in particular. You know, this is like the overall, the generic, uh, the overview of, of how you learn things, how you, how you um, like handle a crisis, how you handle a problem, how you handle generic ideas, whatever. I mean, it's, it's topicless, but then you have the knowledge and skills, and this is what makes an innovator together. I'm gonna get rid of this part. So when it comes to, you can be an innovator into something specific without missing that technology part at first. So it's just about the knowledge that you acquire and that you have. And the only way is if you have the mindset to expose, expose yourself to different situations that might um, have some sort of like learning uh, behind it, then your knowledge is going to increase. And you can be someone that never ever touched a computer, but you might still be become someone that has the knowledge about, let's say that, um, so you're having problem with, with food in your little community. Maybe that the most technology that you have is your phone, your mobile phone. Um, but then you can kind of like talk with the people around and with your knowledge about, let's say like um, farming and so on, use your calculator and your phone and some paper to just find out exactly that balance between, okay, we can we can feed and we can make money or, or like there's food for the community, but we don't, we are not using our resources so fast, right? So this is where I'm trying to go. And the other part is skills and the skills are independent from, from technology, like skills around innovation management 
like um, how to moderate groups of people, how to moderate discussions, uh, how to lead creativity sessions. All of these things are not, you know, like are, are topicless. So if you learn these skills, then you can solve whichever problem. So of, of course, you're not going to solve a technology, a, I mean, a, a problem around farming without having technology that is going to include technology never knew about it but you will solve it in another way and i believe that just exposing yourself to this mindset like just really trying to adopt it this innovator's mindset is going to put you in situations anyways that will bring you closer to technology i can just see it in the eyes of people when they walk around this office and they just see the 3d printer and they ask me like hey is this a or, or is this a 3d printer or even better it's like, what is this machine? I am curious. You see, somebody that didn't know anything about this technology and 3D printing kind of has this very first contact with it. This is my, my opinion. I'm sorry, this is a really complex question. I'm just trying to give you like a starting point, but I believe that we don't, we should not care about specific topics when bringing these principles forward, you know? Um, I'm going to, I hope that answer it, Warren. So Olivia, how will you approach change between children, secondary students and university students? Um, Olivia, mostly with complexity. So the, um, I believe that the principles stay the same. Like we, we do it all the time. We're teaching to kids like around the ages of eight to 10, but we also have, uh, for example, and today we have a, a, a round with a teenagers, 14 to 15 around. And usually our customers are, I don't know, between 25 and um, 60. And we need to change these innovation methods and these principles, and we need to tropicalize the topics so that they are understanding, you know, tropicalize it to the country, to the culture, to the industry, but the principles stay the same. Mostly you do it by changing the complexity and the, and the background of, of the examples that you take. And then just a little bit of your wording, but in basically I can say that you can um, you can just uh, change uh, whichever approach you have. In this case, it will be the one around education. You can just change it really quickly to fit to another group. You just need to know what to change. But basically, as I was saying, complexity and and tropicalizing the the examples is the best way. So, do we have any other questions? I can see in the Zoom chat as well. Okay, no, Francis, thank you. Okay, I can close the um, Zoom chat. No, okay, my screen just got smaller, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, well, thank you very okay. much for that, yeah. Nelson. Um, uh, I would just okay, like to point out to I would just like to point out to everyone that, uh, especially with the question there from Warren about encouraging a mindset of innovation in places that do not have access to technology or a certain level of technology, that the words you're kind of speaking aren't just words that you do. You do kind of live by them uh, with an example you uh, didn't mention is about your CSR initiative with supporting the school in El Salvador in actually developing that innovation mindset. So it's, it's your words are definitely not coming from something which is of a preacher is you are living by it and I kind of thank you for it. Um, but thank you for all the kind of uh, insights you brought to us and motivation to go out there and kind of change the future. If you should. And thank you. Thank you for the topic. I mean, um... Half of all the slides, like everything about CSR, um, like I'm leading whisper and I was aware of it, but I put it down into, into other types of structure. The only CSR part that we openly structure that is, was not in a video or in a post wasn't the whisper.io slash story website where we kind of say, hey, this is our vision, our mission. This is what we're doing. And uh, that we are, you know, basically following the, the, um, SDG, the sustainable development goal number four with higher the level of education. Uh, so th thanks to you. It actually was really, really fun to go over this. I talked with the team uh, before. So to have this check, you know, okay, we are doing, we are doing this, um, like we're not bluffing. We're not saying something that is not correct or that is not as, as we're describing it. And um, maybe the last thing that I want to share, I want to share you the, the most egocentric view of why why when i created this company i decided to include this this is the most egocentric view it doesn't mean that i just do it for this but if if you just really want to think ah, okay I, be, I don't believe this nelson is just a good guy all the time he must have something for himself i was scared 
that if my company starts to go well and it's something that is that that it already started to happen that i myself as a founder might lose the path that i shaped at the very beginning so i decided to make this this compromise this this, this promise out loud and open for everybody to see so that it's always there so that you know we're not responsible like for it just internally but we we have this responsibility that we're carrying outside too so this is just me really opening up from 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 the most from the most uh, like hidden part of of where my ideas come or my heart or whatever you you imagine the brain this is like the most egocentric uh, argument that i had to do it but on the other hand all the other benefits that i that i told before they just read there. Did you have a happier life? Cool. Perfect. In this case, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nelson, for that. So I suppose to sum up there, it's a case of success is uh, not about money. It's from uh, attitude. Yeah. Or defining success. <laughs> yeah, yeah, success yeah. Even easier. <laughs> Yeah, great. Well, success is having a plentiful life, uh, a plentiful or plentiful, a pl plentiful. I don't remember, but having if, if being having a happy life and, and making the world a better place is your definition of success, and I believe good things are going to happen to you back as well. I so, can, yeah, I can yeah. agree more there. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, thank but, you okay. very much for being here, Nelson. Um, I'm sure yeah, you'll sure. be part of uh, future activities with us, and I hope you will be. Um, so yeah, perfect. Until then, thank you. Cool, enjoy. <laughs> Enjoy the other sessions.